Welcome to the presentation on the use of deep learning for proteomics and what we intend to do for the future of medicine and how we believe optimization is critical for that. Now, the first topic that I'd like to share with you is the research that we've been conducting on proteomics. So as a PhD, as a PhD student, second year at Stanford University, we've been looking into how can we use deep learning to solve fundamental challenges, classification challenges in proteins research. Now, the first inspiration that we've been taking has been from natural language processing. So how is this related to proteins? Well, let me take you through language modeling and what, and what technologies that we've been using in language modeling so far and how we've been able to transfer this for proteins research and how we've been able to get state-of-the-art performances using that. So this is a classical example of how to take something that's a bit more methods-oriented and then apply it to a field like proteomics. Now, the first key technology that we've been looking into and that has allowed us to make massive gains on proteomics is language modeling. Now, you might ask yourself, what is language modeling? Some of you might have an NLP background, but if you don't, I'll, I'll take you to a quick tutorial of it. So if you have a sentence such as insulin should be taken in the, how do you guess the next word? That's the key task in language modeling. Um, and you could say, well, it should be taken in the morning. It should be taken in the lunch break or, or afternoon. And but you could also have other words in here. You could have the whole English vocabulary. So language modeling is calculating a distribution over what should the next word be. And classically, this has been done with n-grams. So this has been researched for decades using n-grams model and statistical learning algorithms, where you would go in and you'd say, well, given we have this sentence, let's just look at the last word or the two last words and say, given I've seen in there, what would be the chances that I would see morning after that? Or you could take several three grams into it or four grams into it. Now, the issue here by taking multiple uh, words into the consideration is that your search, ba search base will explode. So you're going to end up, if you say, well, I will have all four, four combinations of word before I guess in the morning, that's going to be a lot of combinations of words. And you're going to have models that might be hundreds of billions of parameters, and statistical, um, statistical parameters that you have to go through. So this doesn't really scale beyond four or five gram, and you have to do a lot of optimization for that. Now, this is where deep learning comes into the picture. So deep learning um, is the process of using um, function approximating algorithms, and in particular, uh, the type of recurrent neural networks, as you see visualized here, is able to have a state that it updates, and in linear time, is able to go over a sentence, calculate a sentence representation for this, and then use it to guess the next word. Uh, now, about 10 years ago, this started to be used for language modeling, and today it is the state of the art technologies to use deep learning uh, for language modeling. And it works surprisingly well, especially when we start to use some of these massive neural networks. Um, so they can write entire fake blog posts. Um, there's a lot of word that they might be used for disinformation, making Twitter bots, Reddit bots, and whatnot, because it's by this point in time, actually difficult to set them apart uh, from real humans. Uh, and I think a really cool example of that is this example here done by OpenAI. So OpenAI said, what if we take the biggest model that we could imagine and we build this model by looking at all the data we can find on the internet? And then we give it a prompt and then we just make it guess the next word. Now, they were able to make entire blog posts based on this. And what you see here in the top is the prompt that they used. And what you see below is the data that they generated, is the data that this language model generated just from this prompt. So they, it was able to take this prompt, this input, and then guess the next word, and then guess the next word after that. And so by iteratively guessing the word coming after that, it was able to generate this entire paragraph. And notice how it was able to pick up that, well, Given that in this shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains, well, it was able to get to the conclusion that it was obviously found by Dr. George Paris at the University of La Paz. 
which uh, is located in South America. So I think it's surprisingly it's surprisingly well able to find the content and the context of the sentence and then use that in order to generate this entire document. And now it's that exact type of technology that we are looking for uh, when we want to understand a much more complex language, which is the language of proteins. Um, and as you see here, state of the art in almost all natural language processing today are made by these models. Understanding the core fundamental concept of text and how to communicate, able to build applications on top of that. And what we want to do is that we want to go into proteins because we have, similar to text, we have large collections of proteins. We have Uniprot as a database with hundreds of millions of protein sequences. And proteins themselves can kind of be seen as a paragraph. Proteins are described by about 20 amino acids. And you can see that as a 20 um, character vocabulary. And that 20 character vocabulary, we string together for about on average 300 characters, which is the length of a protein. And that can be seen to be about the same size as a paragraph in a document. And because of the similarity in the input, people started thinking like, hey, well, could we use this exact same technology to find the underlying syntax and semantics of proteins? So in 2019, uh, from the MIT Broad Institute, we came out with Unirep, which was taking some of these early language models and trying to do the exact same thing. Actually, with little to no modification to the original natural language processing code, they were able to create this language model that could extract the semantics and syntax of proteins. Um, and beyond that, researchers have started to use more advanced, more state-of-the-art modern natural language language modeling tools, such as you might have heard as BERT um, and Facebook's ESM1B. And they were able to generate context of proteins. And probing these different contexts, they were able to find a whole array of um, syntax between proteins, for example, what are contact maps? What are secondary structures? Um, and using these in a very similar fashion to how we've seen in NLP, so in natural language processing, you would take your understanding, your high-level understanding of a sentence of text, and you would use that in order to predict a specific natural language processing task. So that could might be the sentiment of a sentence. It could be question answering. It could be a summarization of a document. And we thought, well, why don't we use that exact same type of technology in order to predict, in this case, recombinant gene expression? And it turns out that we can significantly improve performance of recombinant gene expression by using uh, these language models. And this is actually in production today at companies and just got published. Um, by our ability to take some arbitrary protein tasks, find the semantics of the proteins, the underlying structures and whatnot hidden in these representations, and then predict in certain phenotypes that we're interested in. In this case, whether or not they would be expressed. We also found looking into what features do we actually find? We find out that a lot of these, so what you see here is that all of the purple dots, those are features from Unirep. And all of the green and all of the other colored dots are certain features and proteins, such as codon, amino acid symbols, solubility parameters, and so forth. And we find that there is a correlation between specific protein features, actual protein features, um, that would correlate highly together with these Unirep features, meaning that it actually captures the underlying physics of the proteins just by predicting the next character of a protein. And I, I, I think that's very interesting. By predicting the next character of a protein, we can actually find the underlying physical information of that protein. Um, and not only that, but we found like looking through the specifics 
of the protein language model. So this is secondary structure. We find that the regions with secondary structure, it was able to have a much higher accuracy and a much lower variability in this prediction. So specific conserved regions, it starts to have a lot of confidence around what amino acids should be in these regions, which means that it's actually learned this underlying secondary structure of an amino acid sequence just by reading through the symbols. And this here is a, um, so going into some of these early tasks where we looked into, okay, what type of features can we extract from protein language models? Let's take some tasks and see whether or not this can do well. Now, protein um, recombinant expression is not a massive endeavor within the field of proteomics. So we thought, okay, why don't we take one of the most popular tools within proteomics? Um, Signal P, which is a tool that has more than 20,000 citations. Why don't we try and take this language model and see whether or not we can improve performance on this very important task within proteomics? And what you see here is that it did it extremely well. The orange bars you see in the top left are the performance of the new tool, Signal P6, which is based on language models. In the exact same way uh, that all of the different NLP tools are based on language models, you take a language model. In this case, it's built on proteins, and then you fine tune it for a specific task. In our case, that was predicting signal peptides. Now, what we see here is that for most of, the, for about half the tasks, the tool works about the same, or maybe a little bit better. But for some of the tasks, the tool works significantly better. And what we find is that these are often the tasks, or these are often sort of the subparts where we don't have a lot of protein information. So what you see here, all of these different bars are different tasks within signal peptide prediction. And for the ones where we don't have a lot of data available, this tool works surprisingly well. And not just that, but what you see in the bottom left corner is that so these are how, what is the identity to the training set? How similar are the sequences that we are predicting on in comparison to how similar are they to our training set? So what is sort of the test validation training set overlap? And as we get a smaller and smaller overlap, we see that using these language models still work very well, which means that they generalize a lot better than the models coming before it. So Signal P5 was built on a BioLSTM model. But using these language models, we're able to get a lot better generalization. And also, the whole process was a lot simpler uh, because we just had to fine tune these language models. And in this endeavor, for this signal P6, which was just accepted to Nature Biotechnology, we use SIGUP. Now, what we find, and so I, I believe that SIGUP in comparison, um, adding SIGUP together, with language models makes using deep learning very convenient and very easy because we simply take these pre-packaged deep learning networks and then for the few hyperparameters that we have to optimize, we use SIGUP. So learning rates, layers, and so forth, how do we run the gradient descents? We use SIGUP for that. And what we find and what we find over and over again is that it simplifies the process and also, it usually gives us 1% to 3% performance boost because it simply goes into a lot more depth with the hyperparameter optimization um, than we would be able to. So now we have seen how we can use computer science and artificial intelligence in order to solve some key challenges in basic science and proteomics. And I think our next question was naturally like, OK, what are other major challenges that we with the use of computer science um, and optimization, and artificial intelligence can make even better. And a key question here is the future of medicine. Now, what we've been seeing is that we've seen this has been a increase in diabetes, chronic illnesses, um, and medical bills throughout the last century. And we believe that a lot of this might be related to changes in lifestyle that, we've, that we have had. 
Now, the issue is that finding gold samples, finding samples of humans who do not live a modernized lifestyle so that we can measure differences is today very difficult. Um, and also, a key question here comes, how do we measure differences? How do we measure differences between humans? Um, how are we able to measure something as complex as the human body? So this is our motivation for the future of medicine, is that we would like to collaborate with people who live pre-industrialized lifestyles, and we would like to understand how is a natural human supposed to look like? What is the shape of the kidney of a human who is not modernized? What is the skull shape of a human who, who is not modernized? And now what we know from anthropological research dating over 100 years back is that the bodies, the skull shapes of our ancestors were significantly different from what they are today. And it is our hypothesis that not a lot of this has to do with genetics, but most of it is epigenetics. And so in order to back up those hypotheses, we would like to go out and actually do the measurements. And so this is where computer science and optimization comes into the picture. So in the future of medicine, we have a whole set of different technologies, full body MI scans. Well, you can even do a scan of your body with a LiDAR scanner on your iPad. We have microbiome samples, which we know are very important. Most of the DNA in your body, it's not your DNA, it's actually microbes that lives in your body. And we know that subtle things such as mouthwash, diet coke and whatnot, can actually significantly alter this distribution. We have microassay technology. So a lot of these technologies, are technolo technologies that we're interested in, are actually things that you can somewhat easily distribute to large amounts of people. And also technologies that we're interested in taking in a backpack and go and visit some of these pre-industrialized humans with. We're also interested in fitness trackers for the future of medicines. How can you measure your heart, your blood sugar, Sleep. Sleep is a core component of what it needs to be a modernized human. Most Americans today get six or less hours of sleep, whereas we know the optimal sleep for an adult is between eight to 10 hours. And as well as new technologies within this field, such as RNA sequencing. And so key challenges exist here with being able to measure a human body and being able to measure bodily differences. Because for all of these different devices, getting access to the data is actually a key challenge. How are you going to get access to your Fitbit data, your Apple Watch data? Can you even get access to, to, to that data? What about your MI scans, patient journals, your LiDAR scans from your iPad, CGM devices? How do you order an RNA sequence, sequencing if you believe that there are certain things that need to get sequenced in your plot? Now, a lot of these technologies are not really available to the broad consumer. A lot of them are barely available to clinical researchers. And for many of these technologies, especially variable devices, you need to strike special deals with Fitbit and Withings and uh, whatever manufacturer might be out there. And also, many of these devices, they build a business model around taking your data and selling that data to third parties, to your, your insurance company. And it turns out that there's a lot of valuable information that they can extract from your data. We see the same challenges over and over again with big tech companies that uses your data in ways that you might not want them to use your data. And it's, it's gonna be even more so the case with these devices because there might be a future where it's casual. It's normal to walk around with 10, 15 devices on you. Today, we already have multiple. And what happens with your data then? Now, what we're very interested in is to be able to build a privacy-insuring database. 
to build a database where you can take all your data from these different devices, from these different assays, and store it in a place where you can toggle the privacy options yourself. Now, when computer science students today get taught machine learning, they get taught natural language processing or computer vision because we have easy access to these data sets. However, we have so much health data out there today, most likely way more health data than we actually have for these other topics. However, the issue is that you can't just define a web scraper to go out and look at health data because all of this data is stored behind company walls, is stored in patient journals that some people might have access to. It's most likely the people behind the companies, the third-party vendors um, who buys the access to that data, and maybe even a few PhD students at institutions. But now what we would like to is to have a database, privacy insured, where any researcher can go in, access that data in a privacy insuring manner, and come to clinical conclusions. And where it's also easy and normal to run clinical studies or research studies to come to conclusions. Because a lot of issues today and why nutrition and understanding bodily differences is very difficult is because we have a right array of publications who all say different things. And often the challenge is that they usually only run their clinical studies on a small population of people because it's very expensive. So even though we have the data out there today, they're just not using it. They're not able to use it. So our hope by creating a database, privacy insuring database, where you can include all of this data, is that we, we can get to better conclusions about what optimal health is. And now, so some key challenges with respect to this beyond ensuring privacy and actually being able to extract the data is optimizing when should you do what. And these, these are some of the optimization challenges that we are very interested in. Because some, while some of these assays might be inexpensive, others are not. The RNA sequencing, which is one of the core and most exciting technologies today, you can measure upwards of 15,000 different types of RNA in your blood with RNA sequencing. One of these samples might cost upwards of $4,000 to get analyzed. So if we are to make it available to the broad public and also just for clinical studies to make it a normal thing that you would be able to analyze your data and get clinical feedback on it, then we need to understand and we need to optimize when we run RNA sequencing, when do you need to get an MI scanner run? Today, a lot of insurances will give you a yearly health check. Is that necessary? What should you have done for this yearly health check? Should you get some microassay samples? Should you get a LiDAR scan of your body? Could that LiDAR scan of your body show you something that might have us pivot the way we do your medical treatment? And this is when we believe that tools such as SickUp are pivotal because we need tools that can help us optimize when to make these decisions. How do we balance exploration versus exploitation? And if one sample is $4,000, then that's a lot of money we can save and a lot more people we can include in our studies if we can properly balance these efforts. Thank you for stopping by my presentation today. If you'd like to know more about our research and the future of medicine, please visit our website at stanford-health.github.io or stanford-health.github.io. Thank you.